Hello everyone and welcome to the Manchester is Blue show. Before the show starts, I just want to tell you about an online prize we've got on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. We have a signed Ilkay Gundogan shirt framed for all Man City fans. It costs four ninety five to join, there's 99 tickets and there's a guaranteed winner whether we sell out or not. The competition ends on Monday night, 7.30, I'll put a link below in it to win it Blues. Speak to you soon and enjoy the show. Okay, good evening, Blues, and welcome to the Manchester City Blues Show. Uh, I am your guest host tonight, Brian, and I am the leader of this rabble. Tonight we have Dan and Dave. How are we, gents? Doing leader. Well. Doing well. <laughs> leader of the rabble. <laughs> Dear me. Good yeah, time. not bad, lads. How are you both doing? All right, doing yeah. Good. Doing, doing, well. doing well. All right, so um, first up, um, we are officially top of the league. So um, the only question to ask is, what is going to stop us? From staying there, what's what? What do you think is the main thing that is going to stop us from staying at the top of the league? Dan? Our own downfall. I, I don't see that happening. You know, I, I've been thoroughly convinced now. I think the league is completely in our hands. We're the only team that's now starting to show proper, consistent form, and I don't mean like the United form of the past what month and a half, two months or whatever they've been doing. They've been going behind and winning games. Credit to them, they've been coming back and winning games. But we go in front and we keep in front and we do it with some proper skill. We defend brilliantly. We're now starting to score a host of goals. It's, it's our league to, for the taking. If the only thing that's going to stop us is ourselves. If we let ourselves down, that's the only way we're losing this league. And I personally don't see it because we're now starting to see true leadership throughout the team start to rise to the flo- to the top, such as Ruben Diaz, such as Sean Stones in that matter. Um, even Edison, I've seen Edison shout a hell of a lot more. Zach Steffen, he's also suddenly become this sort of cultural leader type figure in the dressing room. Um, especially on the pitch when he's played the past couple of games, been really vocal, been really commanding. And yeah, it's our sort of taking. The only way we're losing it is if we cock up ourselves. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've got to agree with Dan there. I think the only thing that can stop us at this stage is 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 a downturn in form. Um, obviously still nervous about, you know, we've still got games uh, away to Everton that's obviously going to have to be rescheduled. We were supposed to play them in the uh, beginning of the month. Uh, we've still got Tottenham to play. Uh, Leicester, uh, Leicester, it's still pretty tight at the top, but to Dan's point, I'm just seeing something that it's, it's ours to lose now. Uh, we're just playing well. We just seem to have, something's just seemed to have clicked and those players who were a five or a six out of ten or a, a, a now a eight or a nine out of ten every game. Like Cancelo, for me, is... I read a, an article the other day that he is Pep's perfect uh, defender, you know, or wing-back or whatever you want to call him, and they couldn't really put a name on it because he'll play right-back, he'll play right-wing-back, he'll play midfield, he'll play <laughs> right-winger. And that's what Pep wants, you know, these players who can play in a variety of positions and and the rest of the team be able to understand where they need to fill in. And Cancelo, for me, is just an absolute revelation. And I wouldn't put Gundogan too far behind. If we continue this vein of form, um, I, th- we've, got to, we've got to be able to win the title, in my opinion, the, the way we're playing. Well, if we were, let me just hypothetically put this out there, if we were to start conceding goals again, and we were to start playing badly do you think that's enough to rattle us you know do you think this this recent alternative form these last 10 games unbeaten or whatever it is this this run we're on these these straight wins do you think a bit of a knock to our confidence will be enough to rattle us out of this strong mindset we're in the moment no not even not even slightly um going back to what i said the, the leadership qualities are coming out of a lot of players if one player cocks up now They're all round each other. They're all high-fiving each other, patting each other on the back when they've done a good game. And I think it'll be the exact same way if we conceded one or two goals in a game. You know, we chalk it off and move on. It's a complete... If 
for the first time in I don't think any time since the Shape Mansour era, I've never seen us like this. You no, know, we, we we I know we've had a good defensive record a couple of seasons ago, but not to the point where you can trust us to have like if we have a bad game, if if we lose what like a cheeky one nil, like that Southampton fixture last year, if we lost like that and we were completely on top and we were shattered and stuff like that and we still couldn't score, I think that'll be the only game. You know, I think the next game, I think the players will pick themselves up and go, that was a one-off. We've shown what we're capable of, dust ourselves off, defend how we've been defending, let's score some goals. I, I honestly don't see us cocking up enough to lose it. Now, even, I, you know, that interview Pep did after the West Brom game as well, he kind of, he was asked that kind of question and he said, look, mm. we're going to lose a couple of games. We're going to, we, we're probably going to draw. We're not going to win everything. We're not going to win every game by 5 nil. He kind of, he knows already, and I think he's he's being proactive in, in in managing that. That all right, okay, we'll 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 cross that bridge when we when we come to it. But I I I already know what I'm going to do. The second point I make on that is think about all those other 19 teams in the Premiership. I think we've got them nervous that how the bloody hell are we going to score against these lads when they see Edison Walker or Cancelo. Diaz, Stones, and Zinchenko, you know, for, for me, or Cancelo on that left back, who've conceded one goal in, what, 10 games? What what, what do they do? Like, what, what's the plan? They, you've got to be, that's got to have an impact before the game's even started. Like, how, how the bloody hell am I going to score against these lot? Something to add to that as well. I think we're also making it even trickier for oppos opposition teams because they're also having to think about their defensive plans more than their attacking because they don't have a clue yeah. who's the centre forward. L last night, uh, no, sorry, Tuesday, they were on about in commentary. Who the hell are those players supposed to mark? One minute is Mares, next minute Sterling, next minute it's Foden. They have no idea. It it's an app. It's suddenly just start. Everyone started to notice it. But it's only just starting to click with people. We're like, actually, Pet's been doing this for a few weeks now. Why has nobody else clicked? And it's a proper world class, class tactical masterclass from Pep because no defensive player knows which player to mark. And when they do, they're pulled left, right, and center. It's brilliant to watch. And I think that helps us defensively because if they're focused on stopping us because they have no idea who they're marking, how the hell are those players going to break down that attack and pass the ball and start an attack themselves? And then once they do, They've got John Stones, Diaz, Walker, Cancelo, Edison, etc. to worry about. So it, it's that's what I mean by this is a completely different City team from what we've seen in a long, long time. And it's an absolute Agreed. joy. An absolute there, joy. There was a, I think, I'm sure it was Gary Neville the other night made a comment about our, how we're defending more at the moment. He says, I think, I think it was Gary Neville. It was more of... We've, kept, we've, we've, been known, we've had seasons where we've kept clean sheets. The year we won the league... 100 points, we had one of the best defensive records in the league. You know, we've had these we've had these times when we've kept clean sheets. And sometimes we won't concede a shot on goal. And I think he made the point that at the moment we are giving up opportunities to teams. But mm. there is absolutely neck on the line defending. You've seen it from Diaz, you've seen it from Stones. You know, we're actually winning games through sheer quality at the back rather than just being too, too good up front. We're actually having to defend now. Yeah. And that, that basis, that, that, that stonewall back four, He's giving the rest of us confidence to know that. Well, if if we get if we do concede chances, these lads are putting they are sliding across the box. They're that you know, I don't know what it was years ago that John Terry style winning headers on the floor. You know, that's the sort of defending we're doing at the moment, and that's that to me is more important than winning four 0 and having like three or four really good chances and scoring four goals. I, I prefer yeah. this style of like gung ho defending where it's like we will commit, but we know these guys are well up for the challenge at the back and I think that's the most satisfying part of that defence at the moment. And that goes back to what I was saying to you, Brian, on the previous podcast we did where I said at the beginning of the year we weren't doing that on the line, neck on the line side defender. We were winning games in the first half and then the players were slacking off and there was nobody getting in the way of the shots or anything like that. And it is ever since, you have to be honest, it's ever since Ruben Diaz came into the team. He's done most of the blocks but he's just made, he's, he's given off this, this energy that Hang on, I'm getting on my ass here, blocking things with absolutely everything I've got. You do the same, and they are, they really are. Yeah, Rodri's involved like, a hell of a lot more defensively now as yeah. well. 
Well, they've, they've always, you can imagine defenders are always pride of, of clean sheets. Mm. You know, they've always had immense pride in having a clean sheet. If you win 1-0 and you have a clean sheet, then job done on our end. If it's if you win 4-1, because you'd have goal, it's well, whatever. You can see now with Diaz, he is, he is giving these lads, if this is the most important thing you are playing for. The clean sheet is everything to us. And he, he can see that rubbing off, like, I've never, I've never seen a, a, a whoever plays alongside him, whether left back or full back, right back or whatever, they're in. They are like the ass is leading us over the line here. We need this clean sheet. We're fighting for this clean sheet. It's, it's incredible to see, really. Yeah, uh, it's the first time in my lifetime I've seen a, a, a defense like this. I know we've had to dance point a couple of good defensive records over the last few years, but not they get not the enjoyment. I've never seen a city team ever in my forty plus years on this earth get enjoyment, I the out, enjoyment. Of, out of out of getting yeah. clean sheets i ne- never ever have it's always been the swashbuckling you know yeah we'll, we'll we'll do our best you know we've had some great defenders over the years as well but it's always been about the attacking play and let, let's get a couple of goals and if it's 2-1 then then so be it there's an enjoyment now which it's got to be a surprise for a Pep Guardiola team as well because we've not seen that with with Barcelona or Bayern Munich or City before of, well, we're, we're, we're building on a, we're building on a clean sheet rather than we're going to go out and destroy you with five, six goals today. Yeah, exactly. And on top of that, if we keep this whole team, this collection of team together and not have a big sale of our back line anytime soon, they're all relatively young as well. Cancelo is, what, 26, 27? Zinchenko is 23. Diaz is 23. Stones is 25. And Carl Walker's still got three years in him. Exactly. Yes. He's fading away at the moment, isn't he? Yeah. So speaking of back four, let's let's uh, let's go on to the City versus Sheffield United game of the weekend. Let's see what see if we can predict the outcome for uh, well, the the squad for that game, the starting eleven. Um, I think. I mean, I'll go first. Um, yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw my hand in the in here and say he's gonna keep the same team. I, I think he I think he he'll keep the same team. I don't think he'll. He's no, no rush to bring Walker back. And as much as I don't like to admit it, playing with a false nine at the minute, the last few games, we've been more efficient with a false nine than we have a number nine. And the way, how fluid we've been with Mares rotating with Sterling, you know, and Bernardo Silva and Gundogan's been dropping in there left, you know, the, the amount of times that they spend in that position over, over the position in the team, I think, for me, it has to be the same 11. Why not? Considering we've just scored about five goals as well, I'm in relative comfort. What do you think, Dan? Um, I, 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 I'd be hesitant to say I agree. I do. But it's Pep. We, we know it's not going to be the same team, no matter what. It, you know, it, it'd be stupid not to. Let's put it that way. I completely understand. But What, what change I, can you see in that 11 then? What, what specific player? Did you see missing out? And I still see Foden out on the left wing. I, I'll go back to what you said on the previous podcast as well. I was proven wrong because Pro Foden was astounding on the left wing um, on Tuesday night. Again, you know, uh, but Mar is I expect to be dropped for Jesus as a centre forward. Um, other than that, you know, Zinchenko to stay left back. Did Zinchenko play? I, I, you know, it was 5 0. I'll sort of forget who was playing yeah, because Zinchenko played about an hour and he put Laporte there because the he made a couple of changes on like the 50th minute, didn't he? Five minutes into the second yeah, half, yeah, so surprising it, for him. It, it, it was just, you know, I've, I, I was just more in tune to the, how well we played. So for me, Maris has to be the one that's dropped for, J, for Jay's Deuce. Um, but I think he'll be more or less keeping the same team because after seeing what Sheffield United did to United last night. Pep, he, he does, he doesn't act it, but he, he will be quite worried that they've got that little spring in the step. One Manchester club down, will they take on the second? So I can see yeah. it. It's not of I can see him going into it a bit more tactical awareness about them. What are your thoughts on yeah. Dave? Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be the same sort of formation. Um, so yeah, I was just looking at the team as well, and yeah, who was left out was you know Jesus. Laporte, uh, Torres, obviously, uh, Mendy, Fernandinho. No, uh, you know, I know they came on with the sub, but Strong this, bench. Point, this, is, this is Pep. We've got Burnley then on Wednesday night, and then we've got Dippers away. 
uh, the following the following Saturday or Sunday. I think he'll make some changes. I, I I'm tending to agree with Dan. I think the formation will stay. Won't be surprised if Walker comes in for Cancelo, uh, and, and maybe or Cancelo moves over to left back for Zinchenko. And yeah, I'll maybe Jesus will start instead of uh, Mares. But I like this false nine. I think we're all kind of seeing now that Jesus isn't the striker. But I think he would work well, Jesus, well in a false nine position where he's able to go across the front three rather than being saying, stay in the middle and and get some goals. I think he struggles with that. I think he'd be better as a forward three and being able to swap positions when available. So those are the only potential changes that I can see. So let me, so let me put this to you lads now then. If we had a full strength team, everybody was fit, Mm-hmm. And we're in the form we're in now. Who do you play at right back? Given the, and I'm going to say, the left back is strong. The left back position is not up for grabs here. You have to choose between Cancelo and Walker at right back. Who do you put in at the moment? Walker. I, I, I've got to go Cancelo. i like, he just seems first. to have everything to his game that Pep wants, and he. Not, not to say that Walker doesn't add goals, but I, I think Cancelo provides more of a threat going forward than Walker does. See, for me, I think it's just the overall game Walker brings for me. Walker brings in that threat of goals. Not as much Cancelo, I will grant. I'm not, again, I'm not going to take anything away from Cancelo. He's been right up there, one of the top three players so far this season. He's been absolutely outstanding. But, the tactics in do you know what actually I'm gonna change my mind. I will go Cancelo because I've just I've just argued myself in my own head there. Cause I was gonna say the way Pep plays the tactics in keeping Walker at the back and using his sprint speed to get back and defend, we don't need because I've got Ruben Diaz and John Stones. Last season I would have said, yeah, Walker hands down if Cancelo was playing the same way he was Walker hands down because I don't trust our defence. But right now. No, sod it. Cancelo. Yeah, I agree with Dave. I, I think I think Cancelo adds more hmm. in that when the ball when the ball shifting from one wing to the other and that full back comes into midfield to supplement the space left by the guys that are moving forward. I I mean Kyle Walker's done that job, but that's about as good as Kyle Walker can be going forward. He, after that, you know, after that number eight role on the right side of the three, when he needs to go further than that, you know, when he has to make this kill a ball through and he has to make this sprint 10 yards to make a bit of space. I think that's where Cancelo's got him beat. Cancelo is comfortable playing anywhere on that right hand side. You know, if if he, if we signed him as a right wing, he wouldn't be disappointed with his performances. If we signed him yeah. and he was if he was a right side of midfielder and he was playing like that, you wouldn't be disappointed. And given the fact that he's a right back, you know, and he's doing this, it is so versatile, which I think for me at the minute, I love Kyle Walker and it's a horrible decision to have to make, but it's a good, good it's a good choice to have. And it like really for me, Cancelo at the minute on his form and his adaptability, I think he has to start above him mm-hmm. week in, week out. Now I would I wouldn't that hurts to say because Kyle Walker's probably given the given the, before the resurgence of our back of our centre backs, he was probably our best defender. Yeah. yeah. At the start of the season. So I would agree with that. So let's uh, let's move on to some predictions then. Um for the weekend, City versus Sheffield United. I'll go with you first, Dave. What are you thinking? Uh, tough game. I mean, they they always are. You know, I'd said against West Brom, I was really surprised. I thought we, I thought they'd just put eleven men behind the ball and they'd make it difficult. I was so surprised. You know, we just battered them. Um, I will go with. Uh, I I just think defensively we're just so good right now. Um, I I think we'll just have them in a, in our pocket uh, when they're going forward. I'll go. I don't think we'll smash them. I'll go. I'll go just a nice two 0 He's gone for a win. Who are you? What have you done with Dave? <laughs> because it must be because I'm in. I'm here. It must be me. Because we're we're playing to our potential. Hmm. Nah. Hey, we are, we are at Bramall Lane. I'm not mistaken in that, are we? No, this is at Etihad. Oh. Yeah. Oh, are we? Oh, right. Oh, Jesus. In that case, four 0 
Oh. So, yeah, it's, I thought we were at Bramall Lane. That's what I thought I was expecting. No, a, uh... We beat them. Remember when we were going through a bit of a, a patch and we 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 got a 1 0 at, at their ground earlier in the season? I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> it's been such I a buzz. Mean, yeah, 4 0 for me. I mean, if looking at the result that they got on midweek, if they were to beat us, it would probably be the greatest ever set a back-to-back results by any team in the Premier League that is struggling. Mm-hmm. I don't think you could have two bigger wins back-to-back away from home. No, beating the top two away from home. Yeah. No. And only having started, they only had like, they'd have like two, three points or something before last night. Was it five points? Yeah. Five, yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm going to say, given our current form and our new kind of false nine, quite fluid attack, I'm going gonna to go with three. 3-0. Um, you're going to be looking at on Twitter afterwards all the stats of all these, like, somebody's game my numbers, you're going to see Rodri's made, like, 95 passes. Gundogan's been 85% pass success, six successful dribbles. I think it's going to be one of those sort of games where it's just, um, you could simulate the game and it'd be 3-0 and we'd we'll take that and I would be very happy just to move on. Another one, another win, done. done. Also, yeah. a nice, comfortable win and show how easy it is to beat Sheffield United. If we actually, if you're actually a, a, an attacking team, which we are, United weren't that great, but we are a fluid attacking team, so I think we can do them a bit of damage. See, that, yeah. that's one thing I was going to add. Um, although I went for a 4 0, I want nothing, whoever's listening to this, I want nothing taken away from my thoughts of how unlucky Sheffield United have been this season because let's be honest, they haven't changed in the way they play from last year at all. The, the to play the same way it's just last year they were winning games by the odd one goal and they were playing well this year they are playing well they're not like other teams that are getting smashed three four five no week in week out like West Brom are they, they, they are playing some good football and the results just haven't gone their way if you know what I mean so credit to them but to go back to what you said Brian and I said it last night when I predicted this scoreline although I predicted five nil for Halifax I've changed it to four nil but the only thing that works in our favour compared to United last night is our passing. Sheffield United, when United had the ball last night, they were awful passing. And Sheffield, credit to them, they attacked when they could. But when we have our passing, in we use the word Dave said, fluidity, you, you can't take away from City's passing and there's nothing that Sheffield United will do about it. And I think that's just oh, what's going to edge us. We pass the pass teams to death, don't we? Yeah, exactly. To death and after an hour, they just got and they can't they can't fight any longer. And yeah. especially a team like Sheffield United, they were given everything midweek, and you know they're going to be coming to us knowing that they're going to they're going to be due one. But I think for us, it's just a matter of if it gets to an hour and it's still nil, they'll just keep doing what we're doing because they're not going to they're not going to hold out forever. And if they do, fair play to them. Yeah. You know, Chris Wilder's worked yeah. hard with them, and he, there were shouts for him to be sacked months ago, weren't they? About how he's like. Not to the job, and you can see how much it means to them. Yeah. Getting some good results in a minute. They yeah. they are favourites, though, aren't they? Now, um, before last night, that uh, not favourites, should I say? The were strong feelings that Sheffield United could overturn this and stay in the league, and I wouldn't put it past them. I really wouldn't put it past them. They just need a good string of results. And I think that might that game last night might have been their springboard. However, I don't think they'll follow it through with a City win. That's good. I hope they do because yeah. Yorkshire team. I, think right, for for me, I just wanted to make a point that you know, Brian, you said about us. You know, we 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 pass teams to death, and you know, after an hour, seventy-five minutes, these teams are done, and we 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 we've been doing that for two or three seasons now. And my fear was. We kind of, I, I think it got found out a little bit that, all right, we're just going to put players behind the ball and, you know, they're going to pass, 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 and they're not going to make anything of it. I really think that what the difference is that what I've seen, because we, it's still somewhat the same game, it's this rotating nine, it's this forward three who are moving positions, which is, which I think Pep's philosophy is still the same. Let's just pass and get in the channels and let's use the space and support. And, and, you know, when someone goes forward, fill in that space, that's not changed. For me, it's what's confusing the opposition now is, 
I don't know where to pick up De Bruyne, uh, Bernardo, Foden, which, uh, you know, which, Aguero. Which kind of that, that for me is that little tweak that's changed over the last three months. And that's the, the, I think the perfect way to describe that is them two goals Gundogan scored midweek was in that position. Yeah. So he, he filled that false nine in and grabbed himself two goals out of it. Yeah. And they and wouldn't we have been doing that. To Gundogan. Yeah. And we were, and that for me was my fear. And that's why I was just so concerned for those first few months of the season that we're not, we're creating chances, but we're not, there's no penetration. You know, teams just know what to do with us. And I think Pep realized that. And just change, just tweak that philosophy a bit of it. Yeah, number one, we don't have a recognised striker anyway, so we had to do something. And number two, we realised, well, I'm just going to confuse the opposition now and have these brilliant players, the Foden, the Torres, the Jesus, the Bernardo, the De Bruyne, the Gundogan. I'm just going to confuse them by throwing them into a false nine and they, they, just, they just won't know who to pick up. Yeah. So that's why you're seeing these runs all the time, to your point, Brian, of, Rodri or Gundogan or whoever going, where, where the bloody hell did he come from? They, they don't know what to do. No. So, um, a point that Tom asked me to bring up to you, lads, is um, about Phil Foden game time. Now, let me just read you these stats from this season. So, um, Jack Grealish has played 1,530 minutes this season. Uh, Jaden Sancho has played 1,770 minutes this season, 77 minutes this season. And Phil Foden has played 1,782 minutes. So that puts him head in playing time of who is, who is considered to be his probable rival in the England team in a minute, in Jack Grealish for this superstar coming through, this new Gaza. And then obviously Jaden Sancho is, was on the name on over his lips a couple of seasons ago. So the thing is, is Pep's, I mean, is the narrative that Foden doesn't play enough is it time to put that away and say he is playing enough now? Let him just be who he is and enjoy it. And we accept the fact that he's in this starting eleven now for the, as we move forward. That is a great question for for me because of the way that we're playing now with this false nine and Foden can play across that front three uh, in any position. Really, kind of play in a midfield position as well if we change the formation a little bit. I, I honestly believe he's Pep has recognised Pep Foden's value, and he—I mean, he always did do from the age of seventeen anyway. But I think he's getting enough time, and uh, you know, Halifax has certainly made the point before now. I think you have as well, Brian. This is about rotation. This is about ensuring we've got Burnley away, which is going to be a tough game on Wednesday night. We've got uh, Dippers away four days later, and then we're in, and, you know, we're coming up to Champions League as well. I think Foden's going to get his minutes. You know, I, I really do. What about you, Dan? I have to agree. Uh, but I am actually quite surprised by them stats, especially against Jack Grealish, you know, considering at the beginning of the season, you hardly saw Foden in the Premier League, especially, you know, he played a lot of Champions League minutes, a lot of cup games, but Premier League was non-existent other than the last five, ten minutes of a game, if that. Um, so I am quite surprised by that. But at the same time, the game against West, uh, West Brom, that was his 100th appearance in all competitions. Where that's come from is beyond me, but he, he's in the past, what, five games now, way out ahead of everyone in terms of form. He's been the best player on the pitch, hands down, no competition for the past five league games straight. And I I've, I always said it, I said it on the previous podcast we did, Brian, that he, he Pep's managed him well. Uh, you know, there was a lot of people confused why he wasn't playing. Just letting him have that sit back, especially last year when it was uh, Silver Swan Song with City. Just, just that watching it, you know, especially when um, when either De Bruyne or Silva is out of the team, just embracing the fact, look, I could be in there and I could adapt to this team. I could make this team my own. And he's now starting to come in with that Manchester blood, that hopefully future captain material, as Dave always says, he's going to be the next Stevie Gerrard for us. I think he's going to be that next step forward, especially the way he's been. Just the maturity. I know he had that blip with the England scenario, but the maturity that boy has at the age of 20 years old and the way he's playing, 
it wouldn't surprise me if he doesn't miss any game, bar injury or suspension, miss any other game this season. Yes, he'll be substituted on and off here and there, but it wouldn't surprise me if he plays in every single game for the rest of the season. He, he's that good and he's got that much energy and he's just that mature. He, he's finally that Foden we're all expecting to see grow up. Yeah, I think that point there is is key because we was all expecting, once David Silva left, that you'd expect Phil Vaughan to walk in. It was like, you never ever knew that David Silva played for us. You'd expect it to be just a natural progression. Yeah. And I don't think they're similar players at all. No. You know, we could, I think Phil Foden could do what David Silva on in small doses, but I think Phil Foden's ability is he's quick on the ball. He's a forward thinker. He wants to score goals, whereas David Silva wasn't really that. And I mean, I, I believe Foden can play those little intricate passes. And when he when he starts to mature, you know, when he starts to get into his mid twenties and he can affect the game anywhere on the pitch, I think we'll start to see that. But David Silva was like that when we signed for when he signed for us. He was just this really sh- diminutive left hand side player, and then he started to get a ball and move inside, and he started to things a bit in this. You know, this guy can play. Yeah. You know, but so I think seeing now what Phil Foden playing left hand side. I mean. We had a conversation a few weeks as well, maybe about two months ago now, saying like we couldn't see a place in the starting eleven for Foden. Mm. There wasn't a place for him. We, we went through the positions and said, who would you choose? And on form and ability, he wasn't in that. And now he is, without doubt, that name on that left-hand side of the pitch. He will he will play in the left. I think he will play in the left wing. He's made that position his own. And he's done well to step up to the plate when he's had the chance. But not only that, he's made Sterling go out to the other wing and the last four years, it was Sterling's position. Barry and Sane were there, but even then, they still swapped about a bit. A bit. And Sterling, when we won the league comfortably, he was on that side of the pitch a lot. You know, so to push Sterling away, great, all credit to Phil Foden for that. Yeah, I think I. If you do, you remember Dan? I did a post several months ago now about you know stats of 19, 20 year olds. You know, with these yes. with these similar players. Deco, Iniesta, Xavi, Gerard, you know, Lampard. Still in single the figures, 20, yeah. They've got, they had nothing like the stats that, that Foden had done. So, you know, as a City fan and as a, as a you know, someone who wants a, a local lad to do well, you've got to be honest and say that City have managed him absolutely perfectly because he's got all these honours already under his belt, Premier League titles and FA Cups and Charity Shields and what, whatever else. He's got loads more appearances than Gerard, Lampard, whoever else at, at, at the same time. And he's and he's only going to get better. And to Dan's point, barring injury, he's going to be, he's going to, he's, we've got another 15 years of seeing, seeing this player and he's only going to get, he's only going to get better. I think, I think one thing that all of us get annoyed about is when we look at that team sheet and I'm going to mention the name Mares. And when we see Mares playing and Foden on the bench, whether we know that Foden's played, you know, two days before, I, th- I tend to think we all get a little bit annoyed. Like, what the bloody hell is he playing Mares again for? And, you know, when Foden's on the bench and we have to be realistic that if Foden will get his minutes. You- you've just proved the point, Brian. He's played more than, than Grealish and... and um, yeah, there's, there's, nothing wrong with, there's, no- there's nothing wrong with missing a few games. You know, I mean, I, I've just mentioned a few. I mentioned Alex Ferguson um, over the time and stuff like that. Um, you put a young lad in the team. You don't keep him in the team forever. You put him in for six weeks, let him play five, six consecutive games, bring him out for a few weeks, let him learn, you know, let him get that hunger to play again. I think Phil Foden's had that. He's had that period of play two games, you know, play the game, had a good game. Next game, he's on the bench. You know, play a Champions League game, play a league game. He's miss, missing for two games. I mean, Bringing him on for five minutes into the game, he's giving, he's giving this guy the hunger to keep you know, to play. And then when he's on, when he's when he's in form now, he can't, he can't drop him. I mean, he, he can be rested, but if we was to if he was to not play seven seven games, he'd be, I would be worried. But I don't see that with Pep now. I think Pep trusts him, and I think he's earned that trust. I'd completely agree. I'd Just, love. To- I mean, we we've, we've talked about this in our group chat. If he keeps progressing, imagine how good he's going to be when he hits his prime. I mean, think of Lionel Messi when he was that he was like twenty three, between twenty three and twenty six when he banged in, you know, like a hundred goals over over the course of a year. I'm not saying Foden will do that, but that's what was his best period. 
we're three, four years away from seeing Foden at a pot potential peak. Yeah, and it, you know it's, you, it's frightening. Uh, a good thing that I am looking forward to seeing is um, if I can go back to that Cheltenham FA Cup game, uh, that run across the middle of the pitch into the right flank and back inside another shot turned down. He has them sort of runs quite a bit often now. You know, he'll have, he'll beat three or four men and he'll get like a blocked shot or something. Sooner or later, one of them is going to go in. And then one one goes in, he's going to keep trying and doing it. And then after, I'd like to think in two or three years' time, them sort of things you'll see more and more often. And if you start, if they start going in, you know, the, the world's at his feet. That, and if you can do that and be at the performance levels that he's at now, getting the minutes, I mean, you're looking at, the potential of being one of the probably the best player we've ever had, and that is given our last 10 year period, is quite a mm -hmm. to look forward to. I'd love to know the last 20 year old, I'd love to know the last regular first team 20 year old has won everything domestically under his name. I mean, I mean you're going back to <laughs> in, our, in our lifetime, Ronaldo at United was probably that kind of level, he was influencing games. I think he arguably was at a higher level than what Foden is now. But look at look at the career Ronaldo had. If Foden goes on to even half of that career, I think he's done what what the next 10, 15 years we're going to look forward to. The yeah. difference between Foden, Ronaldo, and Messi, and that's a high category. I've just put him in. Like <laughs> you can stick Foden anywhere in that midfield and front three, anywhere, and he will have a good game. Now, Messi was more right and central. Ronaldo was more left and central. Foden right, left, attacking forward a little bit deeper, can play anything. And that's the joy about him. And I think that is where most of his minutes and games are going to come. And I mean, we're on about Messi was 23 when he started hitting 100 goals or whatever. By the age of 23, Foden could have 200 City appearances under his belt. That That is... And that's believable. That's 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 the key yeah. word. It's believable. He's only just hit 100 and he's only 20. 200, you would not put it past being 23 years old and having 200 appearances under the new belt at all. Well, no, I mean, the way he's playing now, you think the next two calendar years, he could be in what well, this time next year. So you're looking at December 2022, he'd probably be a millionaire. He'd be, no, he'd be able to. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. I had to. I mean, given the amount of games that we're going to have to play between now and December next year, you'd, you'd, you'd like to think he'd probably be having over 100 appearances yeah. by then. You know, a good 50 league games, 40, 40, 40 league games and 20, 30 cup games. He's going to be getting close to 100, another 100 games. Yeah. Easy. So I think we can all categorically dispel the narrative that he doesn't play enough. I think we're happy with how many, how many how much he's playing now. I think that's a good thing. Completely agree. He's being managed correctly. And it's God, just well, honestly, tell me a team in the world who wouldn't bend over backwards. To, to have him in their team, a 20 year old with this much experience and this much talent. QPR. Bayern, Juve, PSG. No, the, 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 the generational talent, she just, they just don't come along often. Yeah. And we're very, very lucky. And we should appreciate that, I think. Yeah. All right, so, um, as Monday is the transfer deadline day, um, we, have, we did touch, touch up a couple of these things in the last podcast, but um, the transfer rumors um, seem to be circling, even though the club is denied we're going to be buying anybody and I think we all came to the conclusion that we probably won't but this, this Edin Dzeko rumour doesn't seem to be going away and um, I wanted to put it to you lads that there's a rumour in the Express today that Edin Dzeko has been offered to Man United <laughs> now how does that sit with you if he was to move to that side of, the, uh, that side of Manchester there's no way they've got Cavani. There's 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 no way that's that. I don't, he might have been offered to United, but there's there's no way that's happening. No way. See, I can believe that. I can believe that United have gone in for him because I can't see it. because I'm the, find the exact quote for you. I can find it. Just says, no, it says Ed Woodward has been offered Eddie Zeko. Well, I, mean, yeah. I think he. I think he's going to go somewhere. I and think he is too. I think he's going to go somewhere. Um, I don't. We've, we've talked about. I don't think we're going to be in the market for anybody. Maybe a, a teenager will never see a play for the club. You know, maybe somebody that will come in and go straight out alone. But I don't think we're going to get anybody. That's. I think that's quite obvious. But do we want to? Do you want to see go to another Premier League team like that? 
not United, I, I wouldn't mind though, because Jeco has earned his place in City folklore, basically. He, he he was that lad who headed in the second goal for us in the QPR game. He was the one who scored that many goals against Spurs, screamers. He was also known for the important goals when they mattered. You know, he, he is a he is a hit cult hero for me. Anyway, he's 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 that lump of wood that always chipped in. Um, pardon the pun. I didn't find that expect that. But I, I I wouldn't be against him because at the age of thirty four, he was still banging in goals for AC Milan. I know it's a slower league, but he, he, if he went to say West Ham, who he was linked with, but he's turned down, and he started scoring goals and he scored against City. Yes, I'd be gutted because he's going against City, but I wouldn't mind because he he, he deserves it. He was he was a good player. He really was. Um, as but I don't think the Premier League's the right move for him now. I think he needs to go either back to Syria for another team. I don't see that, or go back to um, tell you Bremen, what, Germany. Yeah, I'd say go back to Wolfsburg. Yeah, yeah. they need they need a striker. Um, they need a striker. They're not exactly in the best of form, and I think just going back to a team that he was loved at and scored plenty of goals for them as well. Just a slower league again than the Premier League, and then just end your career. Yeah, I mean, if it if it was if it was our heart speaking, you know, and if it, and if it was oh, I'd tell him to do one. Don't come <laughs> to the league at all. I don't want you in another no, team. But if, but... if it was all of us in now talking with our hearts, and there was no. Didn't have you didn't we weren't worried about whether we would play. I think we would all would say bring him back. And I think that's the narrative that is across social media at the moment. Is everywhere you see a, a comment about Zeko and City, so everyone's like, Yeah, bring him in for six months, it'd be great. And wouldn't you never go back really, unless unless it's somebody in the in the peak, you don't go back. You know, and what it, realistically, right, if we were to sign in Zeko, so say we woke up on Tuesday morning, um, it's signed, six month deal. Yeah. What are your realistic expectations of somebody like that in our team? So I think for me, uh, we kind of talked about this. I know a lot, Brian, on you know our little Discord chats with Halifax uh, uh, as well. That number one would be a good mentor for Delap because Delap isn't a, a particular pep kind of player, right? He's a, he's a, he's a bigger lad, mm -hmm. uh, but he's he's obviously very very talented. I think he would be a good mentor for Delap if Delap is going to stay at Manchester City, and I think we all want him to. Yeah, he's got a lot of potential. Uh, from my perspective, and I know a lot of people disagree with me on this, that and we're, and we're playing a lot better. I've always felt that we've lacked that Plan B when when we've tried for 89 minutes to, to score that goal and the other team have put players behind the ball and we just can't break them down. It's just not happened for us. And it really was for the first few months of the season. We just couldn't break teams down. That's changed, I admit that. I just always like the fact that, and it's maybe the Englishness in me, you know, as well, where it's coming from of just, you know, lob a big player up, you know. Yeah, they all like kick Stuart Pierce. Put David James up yeah, from the old that kitchen time. sink football. That's what you want in it. That's that's that. That would be the only reason. I would. Reason I would... Could we? Would Jacko or a Cavani or a Mandusic, who's now signed for Juventus, you know, could that be when we've struggled in a game and you know we've tried this rotation of the nine and it's just not working for us? Can we just? And I know it's not Pep style. I I totally understand that. Could we try? All right, let's just have. You know, De Bruyne, Foden, you know, Gundogan, Cancelo, who were wonderful at putting that ball in. Look, for 75 minutes, this pass pass hasn't worked. Can we just try something different? We know Dzeko's good with his head. Uh, we know we could make something happen, like Dan mentioned in the 92nd minute against QPR. Let's just try something different just in case. I know it's not Pep's way. But that's where, why I would like to have someone like Dzeko in the team, just to have something different. And if that's for six months, look, look, Delap, let me mentor you. This, this is what your role is going to be at Manchester City. You're not going to play 90 minutes. You're going to be an impact club. You know, any older people who are, who are listening to this, Brian, you might remember a player called David Fairclough at Liverpool, you know, uh, late 70s, you know, yeah. and 80s. He was called Super Sub. 
He won European Cups. He won FA Cups. He won won leagues for Liverpool. He got like 10 minutes at the end of games when Kenny Dalglish and Ian Rush were knackered. And he'd come on and he'd change something. And that's all I mean. Could we have a Dzeko, who we know has got goals in him, who who could come on for 10, 15 minutes when what we tried for... 75 minutes, 80 minutes hasn't worked. That, 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 that's, my, that's my pitch. That, that's all. Dan, what are your thoughts, Jekyll? Six what if, if he signed for us? Yeah, what would you, what would you, would you think he would have an impact on our team? <sighs> I, 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 I'd, I'd, I'd love to say I'm on the fence about it, but I'd say no. I, 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 there's just an inkling about me. I don't know if this is my heart speaking. I don't want him to come back. I know if it's hypothetical if he did. But he wouldn't offer the same as what he did previous uh, at City. And I know he's matured into a bit of a better striker and he's gone through his best years at AC Milan, at Roma, sorry. But he'd only be used for that bring on for that super sub for the last five minutes, you know, 10 minutes is a push. For me, I don't think Pep would ever do that. I know he's starting to make changes, but he's the most stubborn bastard ever in football, is Pep Guardiola. And I wouldn't want to see Dzeko turn into United's Igalo this season. You know, Igalo was scoring goals for United last year and he, he did a world of good for them. This season he's been non-existent and he's ended his loan deal and he could probably have scored more goals than Cavani. Um, and I just see that if Dzeko ever did come back to City Jesus is in front of him for the energy and work rate even in the last 10-15 minutes of a game you'd have Jesus over Dzeko and I know a lot of people would say the amount of balls from corners and stuff like that that come in, Dzeko can get there it might do but we've got Rodri who's taller than Dzeko by an inch or something like that but Ruben Diaz, John Stones, if those players aren't getting their heads to the ball, what means what's what's to say Jekko will as well? I mean, I don't think no. there's any chance of us changing our play style for one minute in that game unless it's defensively. Um the only I would not my my decision is I would not have him. Um just because you never go back, it's never gonna be the same. We wouldn't use him and there's, there's this narrative around Pep doesn't trust youth. Pep doesn't give youth a chance. If you're bringing in Dzeko, he's only going to be on that substitutes bench. He's very rarely going to start. And every time he appears on that bench, he's long, that's one less chance that somebody like Liam Delac would be in that match day squad. Oh, and I would terrible. rather take a young kid on that bench, a Bernard, you know, a Liam Delap, and a Metcher. I want to, I'd rather have one of those lads on there than bring somebody in for a stopgap. We don't need him. Okay. Yeah. I would, I would, I would take that. So let me ask you a question. I know we went on to win the game three-one against Cheltenham, you know, but I think we can all agree we struggled, particularly first half, you know. And it was, it was a bit nervy for a while when they went one 0 up. We kept probing. That for me is the sort of me personally. I would have brought someone like a Jacko on oh, who can you would have made up of a, that it, substitution. Yeah, that, would, that substitution that Pep made and brought a Cancelo on, you would have brought Jekyll on instead. I, w- at that would, point. You, would you have brought, a, if Jekyll had been on the bench in that game, you know, away to Cheltenham in the FA Cup, live on TV, everyone's praying for us to lose. <laughs> would you have brought, oh, that's my question, would you have brought Jekyll on when we were still 1 0 down? Um, I'd have brought a prime Man City heading Jekyll on. All day long, I wouldn't bring right. you. No, no. I'd have brought. Okay. I, I'd have brought Cancelo on, or somebody. I, in that, I, I wouldn't have brought. I wouldn't have brought Zeko on. No. I, I would have made the exact, place, I would have made the exact same substitutions Pep made because I'm just as brilliant as he is. You know. <laughs> they were right, and that's agreed. We went on. We we demolished them. Those, you know, as Brian said at the start of this podcast, you know. We just wore Cheltenham down. We passed and, you know, the last 15, 20 minutes, they were done. And, you know, lo and behold, we scored three goals pretty easily. The, 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 the only the, point I am making is that, you know, we struggled at the beginning of the season with the pass, pass, pass. Pep Guardiola got that figured out. We're going to have that false nine. We're going to make those runs and we're going to confuse the opposition. 
if that wasn't to work, you know, if that was to get found out over the next two or three months, but particularly in the Champions League, do we, could we do something just, just different? I know it's not Pep's way, but could we do something that's just different? Because that would be another thing they're not expecting. Bloody hell, City have gone from passing this ball 50 times to getting in the box to lamping them in the, in the box and seeing if something, you know, something can happen that way. That's all. But I think the argument of... I, don't get me I love Dzeko. I think the argument of bringing Dzeko in to do that would be wiped out by the fact that Delap isn't getting game time. Delap and Dzeko, yeah. similar height. Delap's obviously a hell of a lot younger and he's probably a hell of a lot quicker as well. And he's got, albeit for the EDS, he's scoring just as many goals as Dzeko, obviously, like I said, other than for it being EDS. If the lap cat, and he has been on the bench, if he can't get minutes to change a game that's doing that, there's no hope for Dzeko. You know, that, that's all I'm saying to that. But don't get me wrong, heartstrings have uh, been you know pulled what? left think, we're talking about him. <laughs> I think I will wrap this show up by saying we don't need Dzeko. We got the main man of Wales to come back in a few weeks, and now I think he's all we're going to need. Transfer window shut. I would. I don't think we're going to buy anyone either. I think. I. I, I think we're done. I. Th- I believe there's been something like three Premier League transfers in this window. Three. Mm-hmm. I tell you what, I am surprised about though, and that's Burnley because now they've been taken over. I thought there was some investment there. I thought they might have bought a few players in the in in this window, particularly as they're maybe going to be a little bit cheaper, uh, you know, because clubs are running out of money. So that, that that is a bit of a surprise to me that they've not gone in and bought a couple of players. Who well, you knows? Maybe Monday we could be in. We could all be shocked on Monday night, eleven p.m. I think that's what the deadline is. So yeah. So Dan Day, thank you for for joining us tonight. It's been a great chat as always, and we will catch you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye everyone. See you later. Take care, everyone. All of us.